welcome to church tonight. It's good to see you. I said to Pastor Gary before, it is not snowing inside. It is not snowing in here. I love that. God is good. Uh, building's intact. We are here to worship. There's an account of a storm in Jesus' time. And it's not the one where he's walking on the water, but it's another one from Mark 4. And with a storm raging, the disciples in the boat are at their wit's end trying to main control, uh, maintain control of the boat. Finally, they turn to Jesus, and he's sleeping. When they finally do address the God of the universe, right there in the boat, it goes something like this. Okay? Just remember, this is God. They're talking to God. Something like this, they say. They go, hey, see all this stuff happening around us? Number one, it's going to destroy us. Number two, you don't care. Not exactly a role model for teaching how to pray before a holy God. Jesus' response, on the other hand, had no hint of an apology as if to say, oh, sorry guys, this must be rough on you. I should never let you go through any stress. Instead, Mark 4, verse 40, Jesus said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Two things I observed in that is, one, he didn't rush to their rescue. Even when their anxiety rose from here to here to here to here, maxed out. He doesn't operate on our time scale. And secondly, while his rebuke to them wasn't what they had hoped for, it was what they needed. That's what our God does. There was a number of men in the boat. Only one had enough inner peace to be able to find rest. And never since the Garden of Eden had God been so close to mankind, though generations before had longed for such an opportunity. And all these men could see was the problems around them and then turn to him and complain and now we have something greater he is not just inside the boat but he's actually inside here and I pray that in our storms in this storm be it outside or whatever's going on with COVID we never lose sight of what <laughs> of who we really have and find that our opportunity for communion, for rest, or for worship is stifled or silenced by complaining. After all, and Lynn's got this verse up there, after all, he is the one who said, and please stand while I read this, so you're invited to stand. Jesus is the one who said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. May God so increase our faith that if and when we finally hear the voice of God, it contains more than just, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? <laughs> Let's not waste or lose this opportunity to strengthen our focus, our privilege to worship. Lord God, increase our faith.
joys, our challenges, our hopes, and our fears, so that when people look at us, they see you above all. Amen.
God loves sinners and he's provided the way for you and me to come to heaven to be with him and that's simply through faith. 6,000 people groups that are left in the world today, many of whom have never heard the name of Jesus Christ ever. Anywhere at any time that is less than 2% Christianity, they're defined as unreached. Unreached people groups are located all across the world. Now is the first time in world history we actually know who they are, where they are, and the possibilities of bringing the scripture to them exist for the first time in history. There's incredible urgency today for the gospel. Kitomondo. <laughs> Arriba las montañas hay mucha gente que necesita de Dios. Y es un reto grande que tengo de llevar el Evangelio por allá. C Company uh, Operation Christmas Child have been brought together by God's grace. And we're so happy that the partnership is working together to reach the unreached people groups. These boxes have an incredible way of blessing, opening up hearts to hear and respond to the truth, but also to give us access into areas that are restricted. The wonderment of it is that the prayer has gone forward with that shoe box. And by faith, the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. In this century, and probably within the next decade, every single unreached people group will have the opportunity to receive the gospel. Jesus is the light of the world. He who follows him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God's message, God's word, that living word, is never dormant. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's true. Jesus Christ took our sins and he died on the cross and then on the third day, God in heaven said it's enough and he raised his son to life. This is the good news and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am here to promote our live nativity, and let me share a little bit with you about our vision. Imagine coming into our church parking lot and feeling like you're immersed in the Bethlehem town. Shops where shopkeepers are bartering for their goods, people are talking and laughing with others, town gossips are running around causing havoc in the community. You pass the inn where you see a young couple being turned away because there's no room for them. There are forging shops and workshops, baking goods and materials being crafted into blankets. As you head to the outskirts of Bethlehem, you see a young couple with a new baby in a shelter. The shepherds are in the field. Take in their fear and excitement at the angels announcing the good news. Keep traveling and see the wise men as they seek Herod's advice as to where the Christ child will be born and then watch as they kneel in worship and present their gifts to the Savior of all mankind. This is the gift that OMC would like to give our community this Christmas. This will take the place of a Christmas service here at OMC. We need people. We need people who love people and want other people to witness Christ's sacrifice and love for them. We need our seniors, we need our families, we need our young adults, we need our middle-aged. We want this to feel like a community event. 
It's going to take place on December 23rd and 24th. And I know for many of you, you maybe have traditions and plans that you do Christmas Eve. And we're asking if you would take the opportunity to sacrifice to give to our community this Christmas. We need Bible characters. There's almost no memorizing as we're going to have scripture lit up for people to read as they go and look at the different scenes on display. We need people just to be the Bethlehem people. Walk around, browse in the shops, and barter with others. We need people to help construct shelters and to get everything into place. So we need builders, people to look after costumes or lighting and more. So if you feel that this is an area that you could serve with your family, with your friends, with your spouse, or even alone, come and find me at the back. The booth is lit up. I'm easy to find. Let's serve together this Christmas. Good evening. Uh, one thing before I get to the main thing, uh, just so you're aware, you may have noticed on your way in, uh, on the uh, music stand by the door, there's a, a document, a proposal summer, uh, summary that is kind of the foundational piece for the congregational meeting on November 23rd. You've seen the announcements, I trust. Uh, the administration board, ministerial, are proposing some changes to our leadership structure. So this one document kind of gives you the summary of what the proposal is and what it's seeking to achieve. If you are a keener and want to read through the full board governance and policy manual, it is over at the information desk. Uh, so that is available for you as well um, to familiarize yourself with what will be coming your way on the 23rd of November. So that's uh, information for you. October, in case you didn't know, was Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, so I want to invite all of our pastor couples to come up. Uh, I'm going to slide this way. Uh, we wanted it to be a surprise, so that's why we waited till November. <clears throat> you guys know the drill. Good job. Uh, it's an honor to honor you and to express, express appreciation uh, for all that you do as our pastors and, and pastor couples or wives. I heard a Christian leader identify the two most challenging Christian vocations. Uh, number one, actually, was Bible College president. Uh, I didn't make this up, honest. Uh, this was someone else. Uh, number two was being a pastor, and uh, I've served as a Bible college president, as most of you know. I I'm quite certain that many challenges are in common uh, in those roles, such as meeting the expectations of people, a lot of people, people with diverse expectations, unspoken expectations, uh, people that you don't know very well, uh, people who don't know you very well in many cases. Number two, balancing endless demands on your time and energy. Uh, there's always something more that can be done and needs to be done. And can I ever stay at one thing for more than an hour or two is a challenge. Number three, loving people that you don't know very well or at all and finding ways to connect with your people at a personal level has gotten more and more challenging. Uh, number four, actually putting the needs of your family ahead of the demands of being a pastor. And family may be the last to say, hey, I need you to get this done, right? Uh, let's be honest, though, uh, men especially, often those demands come within us for as much as from our congregation. Number five, keeping strong spiritually so you can serve from a place of fullness, and yet, being vulnerable enough to be real, uh, attention to manage, and certainly a challenge uh, to feed yourself. Uh, number six, meetings. So many meetings in the evenings many times. And then last, but
but not least, certainly not least, came COVID-19. How to care for people who can't come to church and you can't go to them. Uh, preaching to a camera. I can't imagine doing that. Uh, you can now. Uh, learning the technology. Uh, steep curve. Uh, maybe less so in a larger church, uh, for sure. And then the big question that we're all tired of. To mask or not to mask? And the endless conversations and differing opinions and sensitivities around that. Uh, that is something there pastor leaders have had to navigate uh, and uh, the impossibility of pleasing everyone is a distinct reality in this case. Uh, ladies, you have your own set of challenges. Here are a few uh, that I can think of uh, and certainly I've heard Diane express on occasion. Number one, meeting the expectations of people, a lot of people. And you didn't get hired or trained for this either. And sometimes it may feel like you're along for the ride. Um, number two, balancing life. Church, marriage, children, career, friendships, etc., etc. It is a good thing that ladies are better at multitasking. Uh, number three, how good do my kids have to be? And what if they're not? And number four, can I just have 100% of my husband now and then? It's easy for your husband to be there, but not really there. The Apostle Paul urged the Philippian church to hold certain people in high regard. Uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus were two such individuals. They had served with Paul sacrificially, even risking their lives for the sake of the gospel. Uh, many, ministry does call for dedication and sacrifice. It's not nine to five, and a true day off is hard to come by. Uh, you pour yourself into preaching, teaching, training, administration, planning, visiting, uh, counseling, so much more. So we just want to express our sincere appreciation for all that you do. So on behalf of the deacons, the board members, and the entire congregation at Ozer Mission Chapel, thank you. We appreciate it. I would like to ask the congregation to stand as Richard Weber comes to pray for our pastor couples. Yes, I too want to express my heartfelt thanks and uh, appreciation for all that you do. Um, we're presenting Nutman Baskets, and I said not to read too much into that, you know, but I think you do have to be able to be a a little bit nuts to get into pastoral ministry. Uh, the challenges and working with people is always stressful. And I know sometimes you can get a far away look because you're always thinking about something else. And uh, even last night, I come here late, and there's uh, Simon. He's the, there's a wedding going on, <coughs> and uh, he's working late at night. And uh, you talk to John for two minutes about youth ministry, and you can sense his passion. He is excited about it. And Gary, you're, you're always here. And you're always, uh, I, I've noticed that all the pastors, you guys are always here for all three services. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. And I know you want to do it because, well, not because you didn't get it the first time you hit to hear somebody preach three times, but uh, you do that so you can connect with the people. And I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, the music has been a big commitment too, because uh, doing three services, it's been more work for you. And I noticed that Vern plays the drums and that's pretty irritating because my musical talent is just so small. <coughs> Appreciate your work there too. And uh, Dan, whenever I come here, you're always at your office and working hard and, and just plowing away. And uh, yeah, these people work hard. Let's pray and give them thanks. Lord, I thank you for the pastors that we have here at Old Mission Chapel. We thank you for their heart and their soul that they pour into their uh, ministry and that they uh, pour out their lives uh, for us. That's a great sacrifice. I'm going to give you thanks, Father. Thank you for the stability that we've had here at this church. We take that for granted and how our pastors have been here for, for long periods of time and how that's given our church much stability. We give you thanks, Father. We thank you for their hard work that I just mentioned and we thank you for all the unseen things that they do. I pray that you would bless them, Father. I pray that you'd bless them with strong faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And the responsibility and the, the admiration that comes with this, uh, with this role would, uh, would be an encouragement in their faith. 
Thank you for the many gifts, different gifts that we see uh, as it went through the couples and you see so many different gifts. We thank you for the many gifts that are represented here uh, with these people and how they bless and they uh, can minister to all the needs of our church. Lord, we just give you uh, so many thanks. We pray too for some prayers. We pray for a blessing in their ministry. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on their lives, Lord, and in their personal lives and in their church lives and that uh, you would uh, just continue to help them to be uh, leading pure lives. Uh, holy lives. I pray, Lord, too, that you continue to give them balance and work, and uh, that as they can pour out their lives here, but uh, they also have a family at home, and I pray that they would uh, have the balance uh, between work and between family and between recreation, and that uh, they would have the balance and work. Pray, too, for us as a congregation. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would make their joy, their work a joy and not a burden. Help us to be equipped when they're equipping us and to use that in our lives to, to get into your word, to have strong families, to have strong marriages, and to uh, have spiritual growth in our lives that uh, these pastors can see and be encouraged by our lives, that uh, we are listening to what they are saying. We are listening to the word that is coming through them. We pray too for wisdom. Pray for wisdom to, uh, to know what to preach to know how to say it just right. And those are hard things to do, Lord, and I pray that you'd continue to give wisdom. And all these government regulations with uh, the virus that's going around, I just can pray for, for wisdom there too, how to uh, meet the needs of our church and also to uh, be good stewards of what you've blessed us with and also to, uh, to know what to do with regards to the uh, COVID-19 regulations. Give you thanks again, Lord, and all God's people said, amen. <coughs>
Thank you for that. Now, Lord God, as he's laying and his health is declining, Father, we rejoice that he is your child. And Father, we don't know your will, but we pray that your will be done. And so, Father, today as we pray for healing, we recognize that healing may come in the form of leaving this earthly body. So, Father, we commit him to you. We thank you for him. Pray for the family as they sit around with him during the night, during the day. They are tired, they are weary, and so pray for energy and pray for strength. Lord God, would you be honored and glorified in all of this? We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I said, welcome, and I do welcome you here. Thank you for coming. If you're joining us online, thank you. And there might be more people joining us online this weekend just due to the snow. So thank you for our missionaries. And I don't want to mention all of your names because if I forget some, then I would feel bad about that. And so, but thank you for joining us online. We, we appreciate it. And for friends and family that join us, uh, we appreciate you joining with us this, this evening and this weekend as well. For those of you here, most of you, I think, know my name, maybe online, maybe you don't know so much. My name is Gary, and I am one of the pastors here at Osler, and it's my privilege to be able to, to serve where God has, has called me. And uh, I, am, I count it a privilege to serve at uh, one of the greatest churches in the world, Osler Mission Chapel. And, uh, and I don't say that lightly. I, I love my church. I love this church, and I appreciate being a part of it. And, and being able to serve in this amazing church. We have been in a series called Whole for the Holidays, and we want to continue in that series, Whole for the Holidays. This weekend, we want to look at the aspect of, we want to look at forgiving the small offenses that build up, leading to bitterness and hold us back from experiencing the wholeness that God desires in our lives. We want to look at the aspect of forgiveness this morning. And wholeness is on the other side of forgiveness. In order to get to wholeness, we have to walk through forgiveness. And that can be a challenge sometimes to, to walk through wholeness. But we're talking about, today we want to talk about some of the small things and, and moving through some of the small things. In Proverbs 29 verse 11, it says, A person's wisdom yields patience. Patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. That word overlook there means to, to rise above it, to move forward, to, to get on over it, to, to overlook the offense that has happened to us. And, and I think if we, we look around in our world, we recognize that people are easily offended, and we probably know somebody who is easily offended. And maybe if you don't know somebody who's easily offended, maybe it's you, or Maybe you're not on social media, and, and, and so, but when you get into some of these places, you recognize that people are extremely easily offended. They can be offended by a post that they see on social media that has a different view or opinion than that of their own. Some people are offended because you liked someone else's post, but you didn't like mine. We get offended because we walk into a room and, and you didn't look at me. You looked right past me and I was standing right there and, and people get offended. We get offended in different places. We, get, it might be, uh, we might get offended at school. We may get offended at our workplace. We may get offended in different places that we go to. In fact, if you ever walk up to... In, uh, Man, this is, a, this, is a, this is a struggle that I have, a challenge that I have. When I walk into Tim Hortons and I see the person at the tail and they're counting their change, 95, $1.05, oh, 
Okay, five, ten. You know, I'm, I'm a fed kid, buddy. You know, you could have counted that out at home. Or there's, I'm in the lineup. Look at me. I'm in the lineup. You should use your debit card. It's quicker. Or pay with something else. You know, don't, you know, we get offended by such little things that really don't amount to much, do they? We get offended by the littlest things. And those littlest things, if we allow them to build up, what happens? They, they continue to pile up. They build up and they lead to bitterness. I remember, this is about 12 or 15 years ago, one of my, one of my best friends, we had been friends since we were about 14 years old. We have gone through a ton of stuff together in life. And he met a, he met a young lady and we were excited. He got married and then all of a sudden he decided that he was going to move to another province to be closer to her family, uh, and, and to start his own business. And I was offended. You see, I had already planned out our uh, couple things that we could do. You know, we can do this together, this together, and our friends, they're going to be besties as well, and they're going to play Monopoly till four in the morning. You know, I had this planned out, and now he tells me he's moving. I, I'm moving. Well, there's work here. There's jobs here. Yeah, but here's the opportunity. And so I, I helped him move. I was there. I wasn't happy about it, but I helped him move. But here's what I did, because I was offended. I did not call him for a couple of years. When he called me or texted me, I would, yeah, I'd pick up and I would talk to him. I, you know, that far I go. But I was offended, so I didn't call him. Do you hear how ridiculous that sounds? Isn't that ac- absolutely I was going to say moronic, but okay, I said it. Isn't it. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous to be offended by something this small, this, this simple, this crazy. And yet there I was. I was offended. I was bitter. I'm not calling you. You know, the fun, you know what the funny thing about it is? I never told him that I was bitter. I just didn't call him. So if he watches it, this sermon this weekend, now he's going to realize that, oh, you were bitter. I, I didn't even realize you didn't call me. You know, it's, that's how ridiculous we can be when we get offended by the craziest things. And you know what? God knew that we would, we would get offended by these little things and these, these crazy little things that would offend us and, and that they would build up in, in us and, and we would, we would uh, mull these things over and over and over And they would lead us down a really, really dark road. They can. They lead to bitterness. And what does bitterness do? As we go back to Genesis chapter 4, we see Cain and Abel. Cain's Cain's bitterness, it just just amped up to the point of his bitter, you know, his his, grudge he had. It just kept ramping up and amping up. And what does he do? He ends up killing his own brother. And it started out as something little, something minor, but he didn't deal with it. He wasn't willing to deal with it. The offenses in our life, we have to deal with them. And God was well aware that we would have these struggles and these issues. And he wrote a lot about it in the scriptures. And today we're going to look at one of those one of those uh, accounts in Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles uh, with me, turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to read uh, just two verses, Colossians 3, 12 to 14. And we're going to see what God has to tell us when it comes to the whole aspect of living together with people and what, what we do and need to do uh, to, and deal with grudges and bitterness and offenses. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people. So this is speaking to, this is speaking about the believer, the disciple of Jesus. Therefore, as God's chosen people. So he's, he's talking, if you're, a, if you're a child of God here or, or watching, if you're a child of God, and he's speaking to you. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You, you were a possession of his. You're holy. You're dearly loved. And then it says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, 13 
Verse 13 is where the real rub comes. The, the, this is where we have pushback in verse 13. This gets hard for us. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave. I want to read that again, but I want to add something in there. To bear, meaning to make allowance for each other's faults or simply stated to put up with each other. That's what it's saying there. And in verse 14, and over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So what this passage is telling us is that the, the, the therefore, there's something has happened. There's a transformation that has happened. And if you go back, starting at probably verse 7, I think it is, in Colossians chapter 3, if you go back to, to, to chapter, or sorry, uh, verse 7, it, it, it details the life that you used to live, that we used to live that we were sexually immoral, that we were, we were liars, we were cheaters, and it goes on, and it talks about the different characteristics of what we used to be prior to becoming a follower of Jesus. And in verse 8, it says, put away and rid yourselves completely of all of these things. Anger, rage, bad feelings towards each other. There it is. Put these things away. Why? Because a transformation has happened. And if you go to the end of verse, uh, verse 9, I believe it is, it says there, do not lie to one another, for you have stripped off the old unregenerate self with its evil practices. There's a transformation that has happened. You were unregenerate, now you have been regenerated. You were enemies of God, now you are children of God. You were once objects of his wrath. Now you are objects of his love, grace, and mercy. There's a transformation that happened. And so what he's saying in here is there's a transformation that's happened. Now live like it. This is how you used to be, but now live like there's a change that has happened. Be compassionate, be kind, be patient, be gentle with each other, bear with one another, and forgive each other. That's the, that's the transformation that's happened. But you know, we find it, even as, as, as believers, we find it challenging. We get offended by people in the church. We get offended by what people do in the church. We get offended because somebody wanted gray rug in the sanctuary. Well, actually, I don't know what kind of color this is. It looks grayish to me right now. They, they wanted gray rug in the sanctuary. I didn't want gray rug. You know, we get offended by those things. They didn't consult me. But this passage is telling us, no, no, live in unity. We've been transformed. We, does it matter what color the rug is at the end of the day? We've been transformed. Jesus has transformed us incredibly. Do you know what? One of, the, one of the greatest ways to walk with somebody through this or understand this transformation is to, to look at it as we're taking, uh, as it, it, it talks about in verse uh, 13, uh, 12, it says, clothe yourselves with these things. So back in verse 7, it's take off this Garbage. Take off this characteristic, these characteristics that you once had. Now, put on these new characteristics, characteristics that are characteristic of Jesus Christ living in you, being alive in you. You have received his compassion, his, his incredible compassion. He has been gentle. He has been kind beyond measure. Beyond all measure. He has been gracious and he has forgiven us so much. And so when we walk along and we see somebody that generally, you know, when you're shopping, and I'm gonna pick on, I'm gonna pick on parents a little bit, but please don't be offended. <laughs> I kill me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but please, but I'm going to pick on parents a little bit. And, and but but understand, listen to the whole thing so that you understand what's going on. 
If you are at the mall and you, this is one of those challenges that, that I've had in the past. And in fact, all of these challenges that I've had in the past with, with, with these parenting things, they're all pre-parent, pre-children. And so when I, you, would go into a, you would go into a store, grocery store, and sometimes I still get that mentality, I'll be honest. You go into a store and there's a kid, he's crying, he or she is crying, they are screaming bloody murder and, and, and they're, they, you know, they're, they're throwing a fit and, and what is your first thought? It's like, my goodness, or in a restaurant, I've been in a restaurant and, and there's this kid, that, it's like, deal with your kid, I'm offended because you're not dealing with your kid. And you know what? That's, when we look at it in, the, in light of who we used to be, I get it. But when we look at it in the light of who we are now, transformed by Jesus, we become compassionate, we become kind, we become gentle, we become patient. What if, what if that parent had a horrific morning? What's going on in that parent's life that day? One thing that I know about being a parent is that 99.9% .9 of the time you're running on very little sleep. And if you're like me and you run on very little sleep, you're very impatient, you're very unkind, and you're not very compassionate. And that changes how you parent. But it also changes or gives us an understanding of why that child is crying and screaming. Maybe they're overtired. Maybe they're hurting. We were at Visions a couple months ago, updating our phones, and then it took a little while, and as we were there, uh, a customer came in, and, I, and just because I was close by, I overheard. I wasn't intentionally eavesdropping, but I, I had the benefit of it. Um, but the customer walks in, and he had obviously phoned into the store, asked for something, asked for a certain person. I don't, even, I don't think that person was around at that point in time. And they went and did some things. I didn't hear all of that, but I did hear the end. And as he was walking out, he wasn't happy at all. And he got in his vehicle and just peeled out of there. I mean, uh, the rubber was burning. It, was, it sounded great, but he was angry and he wanted them to know that he was angry. And my first response was, what is your problem? It was one thing that wasn't in this store. Maybe, I, I didn't even know what he needed or what he wanted, but here he is. Like, really, you're that rude to, to, the, to the staff? Then you get in your vehicle and you just peel out of there. You're trying to make a point. What is wrong with you? And I told my wife that. I said, now, you know, what's wrong with this guy? Good grief. And she said, well, you don't know what his morning was like. Huh. You know, when we look, come at an angle when we deal with people of grace and compassion and kindness, how does it change how we view their reaction? How does it change how we read them? We are really bad interpreters. We interpret things incorrectly all the time. When somebody walks in and, and they, 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 it's almost as they looked right at you and, and they walk right past you. We feel that they're snubbing us because of, for whatever reason. We, we make up all kinds of reasons, but we're bad interpreters because it probably had nothing to do with that person at all. It was simply overlooked or moving in a different direction or something on your mind moving in a dire different direction. We're bad interpreters. We don't know what happened to that, excuse me, to that person at the beginning of their day to make them. Who knows? We live, in a, we live in a world where it's challenging. We live in a world where people get sick all of the time. What if they're dealing with something really hard and it causes us to respond harshly? We get bitter over it. We're missing out. If I was, if I would have held on to that grudge with my best friend for 12, 15 years ago, I would have missed out on so many things. We have had probably the best relationship ever since he moved away. 
Why? Because something incredible happened in his life. There was a transformation that happened, a maturity in his life that happened. Him and his wife have become incredibly close friends. We, we love to give each other, share books that we're reading with each other, challenge each other with spiritual things. If I would have held on to that bitterness and that grudge and decided never to talk to this guy again, never to go visit them, never to have them over, what would we lose? Are we willing to lose so much over some petty little grievance? Moving from wholeness to forgiveness is hard. True forgiveness to the other side of it. But in Proverbs 29, 11, it says, rise up. Rise up over it. Overlook it. Look to the other side of it. It's just a small little thing. You know, it's, it's, it's to your glory. It's to your benefit to rise up over and above it. Get on the other side of it. To bear with one another. To forgive one another. What does it do when we start having that type of relationship out of transformation? What does it do to someone when we're kind and and compassionate and caring and loving? And this portion in Colossians is talking to believers. But if you go to Colossians 4 verse 5, it tells us how to live with the world as well, to people that are not, not believers. And I believe it's reiterating what he's saying here in these passages. Be loving, be compassionate, be caring for one another. What are the blessings we miss out of? We're not willing to rise up over, move on over and above and beyond. So think about this. What if we, what if we became a people, a church, where We would bear with one another. We would forgive one another. We would walk with each other through those hardships. What if in our marriages, we didn't hold on to bitterness and hold grudges in our marriages? We do that. I've been married for, we've been married, not just I, we, my wife and I, we've been married for 31 years. And <laughs> we've been married for 31 years. And one of the things, so here's, a, here's something that drove me nuts at first. It's simple. The roll of toilet paper, which way? I like it a certain way. It's the right way. Everybody else is wrong. My wife says she doesn't care. Now, you can interpret this a couple of ways. So when I put it on, it always goes the same way to the back, to the back. Absolutely, that's the right way. It says so somewhere in, I think. Um, But for years, I looked at it as she's trying to tick me off. She's trying to get under my skin. She's trying to annoy me. And, And so there's this bitterness that comes up. And if there's another thing that causes bitterness, what does it do? And what is bitterness? What does it breed? It breeds bitterness. And so the, the, this, this, this one little thing can end up being something huge, and it can cause such a disruption in your relationship. It's about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I was sitting in the... <laughs> I was sitting in, in the washroom, okay? <laughs> it's just, it feels weird. <laughs> it does. But, but there I was, and I looked over at the roll of toilet paper, and it was new, and it was the wrong way. And do you know what? I smiled, and I thanked God for my wife who doesn't get bogged down with caring how the stupid roll of paper is on the roller. And she's not trying to get under my skin, get back at me. And I loved it. It's, it's one of those term, terms of uh, you know, love that we like. I looked at it and smiled and thought to myself, I love my wife because she's not me. And she doesn't get hung up on these things. So what if 
What if we dealt with those grudges, if we got up over it, get over it, rise above it, move on from it? What would happen with our relationships in the church should this happen? What would happen in the relationships all around us? You know what would, be, you know what would happen? People would see transformed people and they would want to be like transformed people. They would want to be like us because there's a transformation that has happened and they are compassionate, they are gentle, they are kind, they are patient. And when I'm going through it, when I'm in the thick of it, they bear with me. And when I make a mistake, because we all make mistakes, they come alongside me. And when they make a mistake, mistake, I can come alongside them. And in humility, they will receive my help. Oh, if we were churches like that, if we were people like that, what would this world be like? What would COVID be like if we didn't hold grudges, work up bitterness because of the different stands? And I'm not even going to list all the different stances that we can take in, in all of these things. But what if we were simply people that have been transformed by Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you that you have transformed my life. Thank you that you are a God who transforms lives. And Father, thank you that you have forgiven us so much. And then we can, in turn, forgive others. God, help us to be as gracious as you have been gracious to us. Oh, Father, thank you. And I pray that as we, as we recognize areas where we need to forgive, that you would help us to forgive, that we would walk in forgiveness, that we would rise up over it. Move on from it. God, give us the strength to do that. Pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for coming, and, uh, and, and I just trust that you will have uh, just a really good week, even, even though it's snowing outside. Uh, enjoy your week.